Okay, let's go to Acts 17 this morning is where we're at. Acts chapter 17 is what we want to look at this morning. We're going to only go half a chapter, and it kind of breaks perfectly there, and you'll see that as we go through. So let's read it to get fresh into our minds of what we're talking about this morning. Now, when they had passed through Amphilopolis and Ampollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of Jews, and Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures explaining And proving that it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead and say in this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous and uh, taking some wicked men from the rabble or rubble they formed a mob sent the city into an uproar attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out uh, to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city's authority, shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying, there is another king, Jesus. Um, And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things, And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the others, they let them go. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now, the Jews were more noble. uh, These Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. And many of them were therefore believed with not a few Greeks, women of high standing as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea, also they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way by to the sea. Uh, but Silas and Timothy remained there. And those who conducted uh, Paul brought him as far as Athens. And after receiving a command from Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. Father, I just thank you so much for your word, and we thank you for the weekend that we find ourselves in, Lord. I hope most of us will get three days, and it'll be a time of rest and doing some fun things. But Lord, we also would pray this morning for, uh, we just think a Memorial Day, Lord, is about remembering those who have served this country, Lord. And we think of those who have lost loved ones, and we lift them up to you, Lord. We think of those who have served, and we're so thankful, Father for people that give of their lives and give of themselves in this way, Lord. But Lord, we also want to give of ourselves. We want to give ourselves to Jesus. And so this morning we pray that you'd speak to us from your word, that you'd just pour forth your spirit on this time now. In Jesus' name, amen. When we come to this next section uh, of scripture, you could see from our reading that Paul and Silas and Timothy, Luke has dropped off from the team. He's probably still back in Philippi. Um, This is the second missionary journey, and they now come uh, to two new places. But as we read, and if you had a chance to read ahead, and again, I always encourage you to do that, there's kind of a couple things that really stick out in these, these passages, these 15 verses. The first is, you have to realize, boy, this passage shows us the importance of God's word. It's there, you can't miss it, especially with the church at Berea. And Closely related to that is the importance of God's word, but the importance of proclaiming Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the answer. And Paul understood that, and that that has not changed. But then the other thing you realize that you should be picking up now in the book of Acts is we constantly are seeing resistance to that. We're seeing resistance to uh, the gospel, to Jesus Christ, to the Christian church, if you will. And we saw it um, in the first trip when Paul... Uh, in Lystra there, uh, he was ran out of um, Pisidia, uh, Antioch. But then in Lystra, he was, remember, taken outside the city and stoned. And they don't know if he died and got revived or was near death, whatever. But we saw it there. And then on the second journey that we're in now, when we got to the city of Philippi in chapter 16, 
we saw the same thing happen as they were put in prison. They were beaten with rods. They were put in prison. And so now they're almost arrested again, twice, in both Thessalonica and in Berea. And again, uh, just it seems to be this pattern that goes on. And the interesting thing is that I think Jesus said it best when he said in John 16, 33, that in this world you will have tribulation. And Jesus said that. And when Jesus says something, you could take it to the bank that it's going to be true. But the rest of the verse says, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And so we need to understand that, that we are going to have resistance to the gospel, to the message of Jesus Christ. There is going to be tribulation. And so the world has changed in many ways, if you think about it. Um, You know, when we think of Paul's time versus now, what has changed is this outwardly, outward, if you will. So we are way beyond uh, in technology and information and you name it in uh, in discoveries and medicine and everything way beyond where it was during Paul's time. But here's the interesting thing. The inward man has never changed and the inward man has always been the same. And that's something that we need to understand. And of course, that's what Jesus is about. That's what uh, ministering is about. It's dealing with that inner man. And so like in Paul's time, we need to remember that, that there is going to be resistance to the gospel, to the things of God, to live the Christian life. The tribulation there, the word you know means a pressing down upon us. And that is going to take place. But God is working regardless of the pressing down upon us. It's sad that a lot of believers will quit pressing ahead when they are pressed down upon. But what, is, what else is new? In this life, you will have tribulation. Press on, right? Jesus, again, is our example in that because he pressed on in spite of everything that he was coming to. And so there will be that, but God is working. And in reality, nothing can stop the will of God in regards to salvation from being done. Man can't stop that. Satan can't even stop it. It's powerful and everything else as he is. Nothing will stop the will of God from being done. And we see this actually as we come to both the city of Thessalonica and of Berea. The other thing that will come forth this morning, I've already mentioned it to you, is the importance of the place of the word of God in our lives. And it's not that Thessalonica didn't uh, see that the word was important, but Berea seems to be the beacon on the hill, if you will, when it comes to this, that they received the word and it means they examined the word, they studied the word, And it led them to a relationship with Jesus Christ. And to this day, we use that term about being a Berean. It refers to somebody who gets into the word and examines the word and is about the word. And so in some ways, this is an amazing church and what took place there. Okay. Now, as we move into this passage, we are about a year into Paul's second missionary journey. Okay. So it's Paul, Silas, and Timothy, and they come to these cities of Thessalonica and to the city of Berea. And if you look at the map there, I know you can't read the writing on this map. Let me look. Yeah, you could read a little bit of it. That isn't the point of what I wanted to put this up for. What I want you to see is that now in a year's time, they are at Thessalonica, and it shows you the area they have covered. And it's quite amazing that in just a year's time, they've covered this much area um, as they've gone that. They have covered hundreds of miles by foot. And again, we think of often, you know, taking trips and it's no big deal. Yesterday, me and my wife went on a ride. We went way up to Oso and back. No problem, right? Get in the truck, just cruise, put on some tunes, you know, not a problem. But Paul did all this by foot. And so he traveled hundreds of miles. He went through all types of terrain. In other words, mountains. We know he already has taken a trip by sea. When we end the day, he'll get on another boat. And by the way, you should do this if you like to dig into stuff. Go into like Google and do a search of terrain maps and do the terrain maps for Turkey or this area. And it helps you to see because we just have these maps and you can kind of see, well, you really can't. I can, but you could kind of see where the mountains are. But it's amazing the area these guys went through. And so we have these one-dimensional maps and we don't realize that. Go find some maps that will show you the terrain and you realize then how much more difficult the trip would have been and what it really took for these guys to do this. 
And, of course, they were trusting the Lord the whole time. And so coming to Thessalonica and Berea, you could see that one is a port city, Thessalonica. Berea is not a port city. It's inland a little bit. And the trip then from Philippi to Thessalonica was about a 100-mile trip. You notice they passed through two cities. The reason is Paul always had this idea that he was going to minister, and I think it was as the Lord led, but I think it was also as he knew the area. He was a Roman citizen. He knew key cities where if he went to those cities and preached the gospel and established a church, they would then in time go back to those other cities. And so that's why, if you're wondering, why didn't he stop in these other places and just go right to Thessalonica? But that's what he did. He went to Thessalonica. And it was on what is known as the Aegean Sea, um, which flowed then into the larger Mediterranean Sea. And so we call the body of water out here Puget Sound. And I don't know if I'm going to be technically right here or not. I'm sure there's at least one person in the church, if not more, that could correct me. And some of you might do this, but that's okay. That Technically, that's part of the Pacific Ocean in the sense that where does it flow out to that? And that's the same thing. So the Aegean Sea flowed out into the bigger Mediterranean Ocean. And this is where Thessalonica was located. And you can see from the map that it was in a great place for a port city. It's kind of tucked away there. You could see it would have shelter from the main body of water. Um, It was located on, again, we mentioned this, this road called the Ignatian Way was a Roman road. You could still see evidence of it today in many locations made out of these massive rocks that went all the way from the west to the east that Roman made. And it was on that route as well. And it was a city that was founded by somebody named Cassander. And Cassander was the general of Alexander the Great's army. And he named it actually after his wife Thessalonica. And so, and then interesting, he inhabited the city to begin with, with uh, people from inhabitants from 26 different villages and cities. And that was the birth of this city of Thessalonica. So it was a good location because of the water, because of the road for commerce, but it was also a good location for the gospel. And by the way, is there not, is there such thing as not a good location for the gospel? No. It doesn't matter where it is, whether it's a main city or not a main city, Cities and people and towns and villages need the gospel. And it may seem, as we read this, that Paul just went here for three weeks. It says, verse 2, that on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scripture. But I want to show you that he probably stayed there, they think, somewhere around two to three months, not just three weeks. And here's why. First of all, during his time in Thessalonica, the church at Philippi, which was a very giving church, it might have had something to do with Lydia, who seems to be a wealthy woman, They actually, Philippians 4.16 shows you this, they sent two different gifts to Paul during his time in Thessalonica. So they say that could indicate that he was there more than three weeks, okay? Um, The second thing is the depth of the relationships that were built between Paul and the believers in Thessalonica. 1 Thessalonians 2, 7 and 8, a letter Paul wrote to them said, be, but we were gentle among you like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, you were, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our own selves because you had become very dear to us. And so again, relationships do take time, don't they? And you could see that maybe then, not just in three weeks, but in two months or three months, these type of relationships could be built. And that's what took place. And then the third thing, when we get to Acts 20, verse 4, 27, verse 2, there will be two co-workers that will join Paul, and they're both from Thessalonica. So they say all those things kind of make it seem like he was there longer than just the three weeks. And so Paul always would do this. When there was a synagogue, he would go to the synagogue, and he went there for three weeks in a row, and he reasoned with them from the Scripture, And then you say, well, then what did he do? He probably quit going to the synagogue. Maybe there was starting to be some tension. We don't know it. We'd have to speculate. But it basically means he went into the synagogue for three weeks, and then he was probably teaching elsewhere, either on the Sabbath or probably Sunday, the Lord's Day, the first day of the week, and teaching throughout the week probably, because that's exactly what we see in Berea as well. But he would go there and reason with them from the Scripture, And a synagogue isn't a church today. It's not like a church, but in some ways it is like a church. And I think some of you will know this, but I thought I should tell you that a synagogue could be likened to a Christian church in some ways. 
It's a congregation made up of Jewish people that come together and they gather to get into God's Word, but they'll only get into the Old Testament. They do not see the New Testament like we see the New Testament. They will hear it explained. The Word gets read in synagogues. It gets explained in synagogue, and there's a prayer as well. And so different from ours in the sense that they're, we're, we're not going to be... Of course, a lot of churches aren't as loose as we are. They're more ordered and stuff. But that is kind of the idea. And the word synagogue actually comes from the Greek, and it means a leading or a bringing together, and it refers to that assembly of Jewish people gathering together. So I just thought I'd tell you that. Now, Paul went to the synagogue, it says, and notice the word, key word, he reasoned with them. And what this word means, it wasn't so much a sermon, although I don't think to say that he didn't have sermon type teachings, I'm not sure you can go that far. But it was more of a discussion, answering questions of those in the synagogue as now he came to Jews and said, guess what? Our Messiah has come. And you can imagine, you don't drop that bombshell in a synagogue without allowing there to be some back and forth and some discussion, right? I mean, you're going to have to have time to talk and process that. And that's exactly what they did. It actually, our English word dialogue comes from This word reason, the Greek word in reason, is where we get our word dialogue. And it means to mingle thought with thought, to ponder, to revolve in one's mind, to converse. And every believer, we need to be like this. We need to be able to reason. I I think our proof text is 1 Peter 3.15, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. And always be prepared, Peter said, to make a defense to everyone who asks you, For the reason, for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. And that is our great challenge. What's that hope in you? And be able to explain it to people. And when it says he reasoned with them from the scripture, that's just a great reminder to you and I that we want to be in the word. Why? So the word will then get into us. When the word, we're into the word, the word gets into us, the word will go out of us. It will then go into other people as well. And it's so important. Let me just remind you, make that a priority. It's so easy, isn't it? And you're looking at a guy that, I, you know, I hate to even say this because it's a a worldly term, but I guess I fall into A personality, right? You know, I'll give my A's anywhere I can. I never had them when I was in school, so I'll take my A's now. But, you know, I'm that type of personality, and I just get up in the morning, my wife will tell you, um, he just gets up charging in the morning. And I can really charge pretty much all day long. You know, and so, but I have to remember, wait a minute, at times I need to slow down and I need to sit before God's word and meditate upon it and study it and let it sink into me. And I just encourage you guys, be wise, you guys. We have so many distractions today that they're not all bad distractions, but we have so many distractions that can take us away from the things that we should be doing whether it's cable TV and all the channels, whether it's surfing the web, and I like to do it as much as you do. It's worse. You know, when I got an iPad, now it's awesome. I could sit there at times. I could watch a show I want to watch. I could have my iPad going. You know, it's just like, hello, you know, where's, you know, you just kind of, I know. We, we criticize the kids for doing that, and I do it, you know. But you just understand, you got to be careful, okay? And so that is, it's a great reminder here of that as well. Um, that that's what he's doing. And notice what he reasoned with them about. This is important, Christ. It says, explaining and proving that it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. And so Paul once was against this. Paul in the beginning of the book of Acts was a persecutor of the church. He arrested the church. And they say technically that Paul was responsible for believers being put to death. That's why he refers to himself as the worst of sinners, see? And so Paul was once that, but now he had become the greatest defender of the faith. Why? Because he understood Jesus was the Messiah. Now, for the Jew, that would be important, that he was the Messiah. For you and I as Gentiles, we would say he is the Savior. Now, he's the Savior of the Jew as well. But we, we didn't grow up looking for a Messiah. But we know, man, we need a Savior. We need someone to come into our life. And help us because no matter even as good as we think we are, we still always just make a mess of things. And so he came and he preached this message to them. And for the Jewish mind, especially during Paul's time, it's still the same today. They didn't understand that the Messiah 
would have to, would, was to come and had to really suffer and die and then he would rise again. And that's why the, there was such a resistance by so many of the Jews in the synagogues against Paul that they just couldn't understand that. In other words, they had missed a major thing that was in the scripture. They had just, they, they, they saw the Messiah was coming. They wanted their Messiah so bad, but they had missed the fact that in his coming, he would suffer and die. Why? For the sins of the world. And so they had missed that. And again, Jesus came to do that and they didn't see that. But he was also uh, to be a suffering king who would bear the sins of the world. And notice when it says there, he explained and proving that Jesus must suffer and rise. That would be a couple things. So he was explaining to them and they say he would have taken them to passages like Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53. Messianic passages now that we see so clearly in, the, in light of the fact that Jesus was crucified that actually show he was crucified. They describe crucifixion. And so Paul would be able to go back and say, look at this. We missed it. They say he would also probably go on to a passage like Psalm 16 that would show the Messiah would rise again. And so Paul was doing, he's doing great defense and apologetics here. You know, this is what we had believed, but look at this, and here's Christ, and here's what Christ did. And all of a sudden, many started to believe because of that. And the word proving is an interesting word, you guys. The word proving here in the Greek means to place alongside. And so Paul might have been actually taking the predictions about the Messiah and then laying Jesus' life right beside it and saying, look it, here's the prediction, here's the fulfillment. And because of that, many came to believe. But again, some couldn't, like today. Back then, a lot couldn't believe because they just couldn't comprehend that the Messiah, Jesus would seem to be a defeated king, wouldn't he? Because he didn't take his throne. And so that's probably a lot of it, that they couldn't accept that, you know? And, but but they, they couldn't get their hands around that. But nonetheless, this is what the scriptures have said. And again, before he was crucified, Christ had tried to tell the disciples, bit by bit, what did he say to them? I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to die and I'm going to rise. And so he as the Messiah was saying this. And then you want an example afterwards, after he rose from the dead, what happened? The road to Emmaus to the disciples, he took them back into the Old Testament and showed them where he was in the Old Testament, see? And so Paul, Peter, Stephen, they were only doing what Jesus had done being able to go into the Old Testament. They didn't have the New Testament in the book of Acts. The scriptures were the Old Testament. And so they were taking them back into the Old Testament and showing them um, what the Lord had done. And so we go on, verse 4 of chapter 17. It says then, and, and he says, And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of devout Greeks and not a few leading women. And so... Jews did believe, okay? Along with, it says, many Greeks, or that would be Gentiles, and leading women, okay? Which would lead uh, to a thriving church then in this city of Thessalonica. And so it was the word of God as it was explained, as it was proclaimed and it was proven, as well as the power of God, okay? And 1 Thessalonians 1, five, we see our gospel, it says, Paul said, our, our gospel came to you, not only in word, in other words, by the word, by our mouth, but also in the power and the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. And so that's a great thing of what was taking place in Thessalonica during this time that we're studying, that God's word was going forth through these this apostles and God's spirit and power were working. And so verse five, he says, but the Jews were jealous and taking some wicked men of the rebel, they found them, formed a mob, set the city into uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. So in other words, they had heard about Paul. And Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things 
And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. And so not everybody believed, but don't lose a sight that there were those that believed. Paul will move on and the church of Thessalonica will get well established. He'll write two more letters to them. And so God was working, but not everybody believed um, in that city. Some were, notice it says jealous. This is very important to understand this. Some were envious is the idea of Paul and Silas and Timothy. They didn't want to see, the idea here is the Jews that didn't accept what Paul was saying, didn't want to see their fellow Jews converted to Christianity. And note that it wasn't because Paul was unbiblical. This is important. It wasn't Paul's unbiblical. It wasn't because Paul was, uh, had Im- uh, uh, immoral character of some kind. They were jealous and envy because of what he was preaching. And by the way, jealousy and envy are sins of the flesh. And every one of us has to guard against those, don't we? We find it, we face it all the time. But that's what's going on here. This isn't spirit-led on their part. They are just into the, their jealousy is something of their own flesh. And so again, um, they, they worked up the city. They enlisted the help of men of low character from the marketplace the ESV says some wicked men of the rubble. And I looked that word up. It can mean the marketplace, hucksters, idlers, uh, low or vulgar, um, hoping to have Paul and Silas arrested, right? So it's kind of like, and we know that happens today. We know what we see with uh, all the protesting that takes place today. You know, it's nothing new. I grew up with that in the late 60s and the 70s. But oftentimes it only takes a few to get a whole bunch of other people headed down the same direction. And before you know it, you've got an uncontrolled thing going on. And that's exactly what's taking place here. And so very much out of control mob, they go then to this, this, uh, this time a believer's house named Jason. And the reason they go to Jason's house is because they say Paul and Silas would have been staying there at one point. Again, another case that they may have been there a long time and they stayed with Jason for a while. Now they have moved on and they're staying with somebody else. But they went to Jason's house because they thought Paul would be there. And again, Jason was probably one of the Jews who had heard Paul and had become a believer. And so going to his house, they don't find Paul. They don't find Silas. But they drag Jason and notice it says others who had believed and they bring him to the authorities and they charge them that they have turned the world upside down. And I'm thinking... It's just interesting because who's turning what upside down here? You're the ones that started the riot, not Paul. The other side, it's a good thing though. Turning the world upside down is a good thing if it meant souls were being saved for eternal life, right? That's a good thing, you know? And it's always good. It's interesting, isn't that? Is our world right set up or upside down right now? It's upside down. So if you turn the world right upside down, you're getting it back where, okay, this is too much thinking. I can see your brains. I can see you trying to figure that one out. Okay, we just won't go there. But it also meant that non-believers and Jews and other Gentiles, they didn't like being confronted with what Paul was saying. They didn't, man never likes to be confronted by, with his sin, his sinful lifestyle or the rejection. And so they charged them with something that was technically true, proclaiming that there's another king besides Caesar. And remember, Caesar is always a title. It, 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 the guy's name isn't Caesar. Like, my name is Scott Vincent. It's not that it was Caesar Vincent, okay? Caesar was a title, and so the Caesar, Caesar was seen as, the emperor was seen as divine and to be worshipped. And so that's what it's talking about here. They saw, they were saying that, they're, they're saying there's another king um, besides uh, Jesus, And again, uh, Jesus, of course, never, ever intended to become an earthly king and an earthly power, did he? And so some charge the Jews, um, the same charge, actually, the Jews brought against Jesus uh, before he was crucified is this charge, that he says he's a king. And it was a serious charge, by the way. If you said, I'm a king, they could put your life out of existence. They could put you to death. So it wasn't light the charge that was being levied against these guys. So they charged him with something that was technically true, but it really wasn't true. It wasn't what Jesus was going to do. And not finding Paul and Silas, they took then money, it says, and the ESV says as a security that we'd say a bond um, from Jason. And the idea is this, they think that Jason um, and whoever the other believers are that get arrested, you give us money. You put down a bond. 
And the bond is, you get Paul and Silas out of this city. If you don't, we keep the bond and they were going to get rearrested and something worse might happen to them. So that's what that's all about right there. And so this is what happened to Paul. And, uh, and note opposition, but they also proclaimed the word. They taught and explained the scriptures, proving who Jesus was. And the result was, again, I want to make sure we don't miss this. The result was uh, many came to Christ and a work gets started in Thessalonica. And no doubt it led to others coming to Christ and others in that city, by the way. So by the way, let me just pause for a minute here because I forgot to say something because of our morning was a little bit different today with Alex. And so when we think about others coming to Christ, uh, my brother came to Jesus Christ Monday, by the way. <laughs> so, so if you were here last week, I shared with you that I was a little stressed out by what's going on with my brother. <laughs> Just a little, right? <laughs> by the way, you know, but uh, Monday morning, um, our brother Gary went down to visit him. And Gary's an old Ballard boy that actually knew my brother Dick. And, uh, you know, Gary's just, a, he loves, he's a gifted, he just, God uses him. I mean, he said to me, he said, I wasn't going to mess around this morning, Scott. And so, you know, he just, Dick came to Christ. And so praise the Lord. And so I'm, I'm happy for that, obviously. We still got a lot of, um, I'm afraid there's still major physical stuff, huge amount of stuff. But you know what? Spiritually now we're okay. So everything's good in that sense. But that's the type of thing we see here taking place. We see that Paul's preaching the gospel. Well, he gets ran out of the city, so he goes to the next city, Berea. Verse 10, the brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. And so next they would go to Berea. If you look up the map here, it was about 45 miles away from Thessalonica. And Berea is interesting. It actually means place of many waters. And the reason is it laid at the foot of a mountain range. And of course, water runs down, right? So it's not a hard thing. And there were rivers that would run into Berea. There were springs in Berea. And so that's how it gets its name. And actually, there were orchards in Berea. Uh, orchards of apples and peaches and pears. So if you think that peaches and apples and pears are a new thing, they've been around a long time. And so you can kind of picture Berea smaller than Thessalonica, but it kind of reminds you of some of our, uh, maybe Wenatchee, where we go inland a ways and we see these amazing little valleys and stuff that produce amazing amounts of fruits and everything. And so they went there and like before, they went into the synagogue. Verse 11, now, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scripture daily to see if these things were so. And so again, very much like what happened in Thessalonica, the difference here though, in Thessalonica, it said in verse four up there above that some of them were persuaded. Here in Berea, notice it says that many of them believed. And so it seems like there was a greater outpouring, a greater receptiveness to what Paul was saying and to coming to the Lord. And so to the Jews, it would it'd be Jews because they were from the synagogue. It would be Gentiles or Greek men. And then it would be women again. Notice Luke twice now says women of high standing. And you kind of have to think, well, why does he point that out? And the idea is probably this, you guys, is that Luke is probably not trying to say anything uh, less or more of them, just showing that the gospel was coming to everybody, whether it was somebody high standing or low standing, male, female. Luke himself is a doctor. He would be in a class in that culture different than the others. But I think what he's trying to show is that the gospel was reaching everybody. And by the way, the gospel will reach everybody and everybody needs the gospel, right? It doesn't matter who. Everybody needs it. I so appreciate it. Brian this week. Brian's mom passed away this week. She went home to be with the Lord. She's up there right now, man. She's, she's like got a new body. And man, all the cares of the world are gone from her. Amen. Give it a hand. But Brian, he actually taught Wednesday night. His mom passed away uh, Wednesday morning. And he'll teach again this week, by the way. Brian's a great teacher. You should come out. 
but I appreciate what he was saying in the hospital. Brian's a great word picture guy. I love this because my brain doesn't think that way. And he was talking about how in a hospital you have nurses and doctors and they're so able to take care of so many things and so important, but the spiritual is still a great need, see? And they, they can do a lot, but they can't do that. And I just think that's the same thing we're seeing here when Paul says this, that the gospel is coming to everybody. Women of high standing, low standing. Jews who were in the synagogue, Gentiles who were God-fearers, other Gentiles, you name it, the gospel is spreading and people were coming um, to the Lord. And so verse 13, watch what happens. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea, also they came to agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea. But Silas and Timothy remained there. Those who conducted Paul, in other words, those who took Paul, um, probably the captain of the boat or whatever, brought him as far as Athens. And after receiving a command from Silas and Timothy to come to him. So they say it'd probably take about three months for Paul to get down to Athens. And it seems like once he gets there, what that's saying is he sent word back with these guys. Hey, when you get back there, tell Timothy and Silas to get down here as soon as they can. And that's exactly what took place. And I love here what Luke says. When the Jews from Thessalonica learn, look at that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul and Silas. They didn't like that. But Paul and the early church were about proclaiming God everywhere that in Christ alone there was salvation. And in Christ there is salvation. You know, people have a problem when we say Jesus is the only way. But people need to understand there is salvation. There is something beyond this life. And I say, amen. If this is all there is, don't get me wrong. I love this world. I love this life. I do. I I, I love serving the Lord and knowing the Lord. I think that's the best way to enjoy this life, right? Is with the Lord. It really is. But I I can also tell as you get older and everything, you're kind of going, boy, I hope there's more than this. And there is, of course, more than this. But that's what we see here, that that's what these guys were doing. And so... When they got Paul out of Berea as fast as they could, Luke doesn't really tell us why. We have to kind of just kind of, okay, what might be going on there? And it could be that they were trying to protect Paul, that maybe he would get jailed again and maybe something worse could happen to him. The other thing is like with Philippi. When, remember when Paul and the, the leaders in Philippi went and said, let him out of the jail? And Paul said, no, no, wait a minute. We're Roman citizens. We shouldn't have been arrested. You make them come and apologize. And the idea there is there was something to, that the church would be seen in a good light. Paul would be seen as a man of integrity. And the same thing could be here that Paul says, I'm getting out of here. And they said, get out of here now, Paul, because he was mindful of this little church that had just started. And he didn't want that church to go down. And he's mindful of those believers. So that's probably some of the thinking there. But we can be certain that the Lord was leading and Silas and Timothy would stay there They sent Paul then to Athens. If you look at the map up behind me, you'll see it was both by water, but then he would have got on land. And again, they think it would have taken about three months for him to get there. So next week when we pick it up and he's in Athens, remember, we already, three months are missing right there. That's important. But he'll get there. And the next city is going to be another effective place, a major place, the city of Athens, to preach the gospel to see people come to Christ and let it spread out from that center as well. So next week, when we pick it up in verse 16, the rest of the chapter is dealing with Athens and we'll get in there. So let's close with just four things that we'll consider this morning. And if the worship team, come on back up. You guys can come up quietly and I can close with these things as you make your way up. Number one, what do you you say, Scott? Okay, what can I think about? What can I take with me? First of all, this, the importance of God, the word of God, and the places to have in our lives. That comes out so clear. We see the importance of the word of God in the apostles' life, in these churches' lives. And it says to us the importance. Two verses. First Peter 2, Therefore putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander, like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. And I love it when my little grandson McCoy comes over. I shouldn't say little because he's a brute, man. You know, that's why my, my, my kids named him McCoy and they are calling him Mac. And it fits him perfect because he is going to be a Mac truck. And he's just that way. But you know, I love it. You know how moms, you could especially relate to this. Us guys are a little slow. But you know, when the kid's wearing down and everything else, and you can see it's almost nap time. 
And I love that time because I could take him, I could take his bottle of milk, he'll just cuddle up in grandpa's lap, and he's a happy camper with the pure milk of whatever it is. Oh, it's 2% from Darigal or something, you know. <laughs> That's what it is, you know. But the same way, we are to love for the long, the pure milk of the word so that by it we may grow in respect to our salvation. That's interesting. It doesn't mean that you may get saved. It means that you'll grow in more and more of the aspects of being saved. And then Timothy, 2 Timothy 2, study to show thyself approved to God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. Let me tell you guys, be people of the word. Number two, there will be resistance. Again, maybe this week you forgot that. Maybe there's been resistance to you this week because of your faith and you allowed it to kind of shake you back and kind of stop your progress. There's going to be resistance. I wish I could tell you, go out this week. You will not encounter any tribulation at all. What I'm going to tell you is go out this week. You will find resistance to the way you want to live in Jesus Christ, to his word and everything else. But keep doing it. Number three, we are still to keep proclaiming Jesus Christ and never stop that. Proclaim him in our word and our deeds, right? And so often, don't just let it be our deeds, that's important. But we live in a day and age now, we've got to proclaim him with word. We've got to boldly say Jesus is the way and he can change your life. And number four, guard against any jealousy and envy in our lives. We saw it with these guys that because of their jealousy of Paul, they then stirred up a whole city. They made another trip to another city and stirred it up because of a fleshly sin. Be careful of jealousy. Be careful of envy. You know, it's something that we aren't exempt from. And when we see it, just nail it, man. So those are some things we could take away. Next week, read ahead. We'll move into the rest of the chapter. Amen. Amen. Well, stand up. Chris has got a song to take us out of here. And, uh, they, you know, when I was praying this morning with the team, they said, how are you ending your message, Scott? I said, well, I don't know. I never really know how it's going to end. But I said, why? And it's because this song we're about to do is upbeat. I said, upbeat fits. Amen? Amen. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful day. Just look to the Lord. Love the Lord this week. Amen? Let's close with this song. <laughs>